بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا ما تقدر دعوة لك تنبعي دفتر زاكر تشنتني دفتر زاكر دفتر زاكر الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام ورسول الله وآل آلي وصابي أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أضو إلى صبي لربك بالحكمة والمعظة الحسنة وجادل بالتي أحسن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شهلي صدري وصلي أمري وحل الأبدة من لساني يقه قولي Respected Mr. Arif Sultan My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace, blessings and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you The topic of this evening's talk is Islam and its misconceptions Islam comes from the root word salam which means peace it also means submitting your will to almighty God to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in short Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to almighty God Islam is a universal religion and it is the duty of every Muslim to spread this religion of truth to everyone. But unfortunately, many of us Muslims, in fact most of us, we shy away from our duty of spreading the truth of Islam. And I started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, which says, اُدُوا إِلَىٰ صَبِّ لِرَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَعْزِتِ الْحَسْنَةِ وَجَادِلُ مِلَّةِ أَحْسَنِ Let us invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. There are various techniques and methods of doing da'wah, inviting the people towards Islam and conveying the message of Islam to the non-Muslim. Some of them may be less effective while the others may be more effective one common methodology used by many Muslims is that they present several good points of Islam to the non-Muslim which is alhamdulillah a good method but normally even if you present a thousand good points about Islam to the non-Muslim even if he agrees with those good points, yet he will have at the back of the mind, Ah, you are the same Muslim who marries more than one woman. Ah, you are the Muslim who subjugates women by keeping them in the will. Ah, you are a fundamentalist. You are a terrorist. You know, you are the people who don't have pork, who don't have alcohol. These questions will keep on ticking at the back of his mind. And these misconceptions will prevent him to accept Islam as a whole. So what I personally believe and prefer that whenever I convey the message of Islam to a non-Muslim, whenever I have the opportunity, when non-Muslim comes to me or when I go to him on an individual level, the first thing that I ask is that instead of presenting a thousand good points about Islam, I ask him that what do you feel is wrong with Islam? with your limited knowledge, with whatever knowledge you have got, whether you have heard it on the television or wherever, whatever limited knowledge you have got, whether from the right source or from the wrong source, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And many will be shy, will not be comfortable in asking questions, you know, because a Muslim may be hurt. So I am making very comfortable. Brother, you can ask any question. You can criticize Islam. You can take whatever objections you want. Only if you want to know the reason, why do you feel that there is something wrong with Islam? What do you feel is wrong with Islam? And after making him comfortable that see, Alhamdulillah, though I am a young person, now I can take it. You know, young people have hot blood, you know, but Alhamdulillah, I can take it. I am young, but I can take it. You can criticize Islam, you can speak whatever you want about Islam, but please let me know what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And after he poses the question, if I remove these misconceptions from his mind, his mind is empty. And once his mind is empty, all the negative points have been removed. Even if I say 50 good points about Islam, he'll accept it with open heart. 
So I personally prefer, instead of picking a thousand good points about Islam, first remove the negative feeling which he has about Islam from his mind and then present even a few good points about Islam, it will make miracles. And Alhamdulillah, in my past few years of experience that I have in the Dawah field, say approximately past eight years, I have analyzed that there are a set of about 20 most common questions which the non-Muslim poses about Islam. And whenever any non-Muslim asks you four or five questions about Islam, invariably these four or five questions will be part of this set of 20 common questions. You ask a non-Muslim, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And he will you three, four questions or four or five questions. Invariably, all these questions will be part of this set of 20 common questions. But naturally, it's based on the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. But many a time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself does not specify the reason why he has prohibited certain things. Certain aspects he has mentioned in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Certain aspects he has not mentioned. So Alhamdulillah, whatever is there in the Quran and Sahih Hadith, I have given the quotation. And the remaining Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Use your hikmah. Invite all the way of the Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. So the remaining part of the answer I have used human logic to explain why does Islam permit certain things, prohibit the other things, etc. But the final answer, whatever reason we use, Alhamdulillah, Allah is the person who knows everything. The final answer is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah wa'alam. He is the person who has the absolute correct answer. We use the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the Quran and Sahih Hadith and supplement it with a hikmah. But the best answer is known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These may be the most probable reason why Allah has prohibited certain things or allowed certain things. And I would request that if every Muslim memorizes the answer to these 20 common questions, even if he is not able to convince a non-Muslim to accept Islam or make him realize the full truth of Islam, at least, inshallah, he will be able to remove the animosity in the mind of the non-Muslim. At least he will be able to neutralize him. So if every Muslim memorizes the answers to this set of 20 common questions, inshallah, he will at least be able to convince 80% of the non-Muslims, 80%. And this set of 20 common questions, how have they been evolved? You know, because you see on the television, on the satellite, in the newspapers, in the magazines, the media is bombarding information about Islam on the television, on the satellite, in the newspaper, in the magazines, and the majority of the media, the international media, is controlled by the Westerners. And they project Islam in the wrong way, not in the true picture. So these misconceptions are evolved around the mind of a non-Muslim by watching television programs, by reading newspapers, and whatever information they get from this media, they think that itself is Islam. So these 20 common questions are based on what the media portrays Islam as. This set of 20 common questions, a few decades earlier, they were different. After a few decades, they may change. So this 20 common question is applicable for this particular time. And Alhamdulillah, whichever part of the world you travel, this set of 20 common questions remains the same. Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have traveled to America, to Canada, to UK, to South Africa, here I come earlier, in Malaysia, in Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, UAE. Alhamdulillah, the 20 common questions are the same. They remain the same throughout the world. As I said, they arise due to how the media portrays Islam as. There may be an additional one or two questions depending upon the culture of that area or depending upon the surrounding. For example, when I went to states, the common question was that why does Islam prohibit interest? which may not come in the 20 most common question, but that's common to that particular locality. Or can we have the meat of McDonald's of USA, you know, with a halal or haram? These are additional common questions. 
And as the Dari Sultan said, even here in Singapore, there may be additional two or three questions. You know, depending upon the culture, like you said, a Malay person gets married, they feel that you should wear a particular dress or a particular cap, otherwise the marriage doesn't take place. These are additional couple of questions depending upon the locality. But in spite of these additional questions, the 20 basic questions remain the same. And to this 20 common questions, I have added a few questions which are specifically common to the non-Muslims of India. Because Indians constitute about one-fifth of the population of the world. 20% of the world population, the Indians. And besides that, Alhamdulillah, Indians are spread throughout the world. Wherever you will find them. Even in Singapore, many Indians. In America, in Canada, in UK, in Malaysia, wherever you will find Indians. So, invariably, and finally, these even become the common question among the non-Muslim throughout the world. And inshallah, I have even compiled the 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims who have some knowledge of Islam. You know, those who have read certain books about Islam, and when non-Muslim reads books about Islam, he normally reads books written by critics, by Orientalists, who give a negative picture of Islam. So the 20 common questions that will come in their mind will be additional. Like a few were asked yesterday, you know, that does Darwin theory match with the Quran? And I give the reply. You know, so these additional questions, like somebody asked me yesterday after the talk, that many places the Quran says the belief was an angel, one place it says a jinn, is in their contradiction. And I give the answer. So these questions, 20 common questions, arise after reading certain literature of Islam which has been written by non-Muslims about Islam. So we have another set of 20 common questions asked by non-Muslims who have some knowledge of Islam. And both these set of questions have additional 20 set of questions which are less common. So you have 40 common questions asked by non-Muslims, 40 common questions asked by non-Muslims who have some knowledge of Islam. And additional 20 common questions asked by Christians, that's another lot. In such way, if we master these common questions, inshallah, we will be able to do da'wah very easily and with hikmah. As far as today's talk is concerned, I will only be concentrating on the 20 most common questions asked by general non-Muslims. Time doesn't permit us to deal with all the 20 questions. Inshallah, I'll try my level best. Inshallah, I'll at least cover the 10 most common questions. And in question answer time, if people want to ask the remaining, they're most welcome. As much as possible, the time that has been allotted to me, I will try and cover as many questions as possible. Most common question asked by the non-Muslim about Islam is that why does Islam allow a Muslim man to marry more than one woman? Why is polygamy allowed in Islam? Who agrees that this is one of the most common questions? Raise your hand. Who agrees that this is one of the most common questions? Most common question. Who disagrees that it is not a common question? Raise your hand. See, that's easier. So, no one disagrees that it is one of the most common questions, which many of the Muslims may not know how to convince a non-Muslim. He may be convinced himself, but oneself being convinced on his own is different than convincing somebody else. The meaning of the word polygamy is that a person is allowed to have more than one spouse. That's the meaning of the word polygamy. Any person who has more than one spouse, it is called that he is doing polygamy. Polygamy is further divided into two parts. One is polygyny, that is, a man having more than one wife. And polyandry, that is, a woman having more than one husband. So Islam doesn't permit all types of polygamy. It permits limited polygyny. It permits a man to marry more than one woman, limited and polyandry is prohibited, we'll come to it later on. Why does Islam allow a man to have more than one wife? Quran is the only religious scripture on the face of the earth which says marry only one. There is no other religious scripture on the face of the earth which says marry only one. You read the Bhagavad Gita, you read the Ramayana, you read the Bible, no religious scripture on the face of the earth says marry only one except the glorious Quran. If you read the Hindu scriptures, the sages, the saints, there are several wives. The father of Ram, King Dashrath, he had more than one wife. Lord Krishna, he had several wives, hundreds of them, thousands of them. If you read the Jewish scriptures, they have no upper limit how many you can marry. You can marry as many as you wish. 
Abraham, according to the Bible, Old Testament, peace be upon him. He had three wives. Solomon had 700 wives. So in the Jewish scripture, you can marry as many as you wish. It was only when the rabbi, Genshin ben Yehuda, in the 11th century, he passed a synod that the Jews should only marry one. But the scriptures say you can marry as many as you wish. And in as late as 1950, in the Safadic community, where the Jews lived amongst the Muslims, they used to marry more than one. It's only after 1950 that they stopped marrying more than one wife. If you read the Christian Bible, you can marry as many as you wish. It is the church which a couple of centuries ago has put an upper limit maximum one. In fact, if you read the report of the Committee of the Status of Women in Islam that's published in India, there it said that the polygamous marriages done in India, the Hindus, so the law says, that you cannot marry more than one woman. The scriptures say you can marry as many as you wish. It is the Indian law which was passed in 1954, which says that a Hindu cannot marry more than one woman. The scriptures give permission, no upper limit. It is the Indian government law which, under the Hindu Marriage Act, has said that a Hindu man can only marry one. And according to the statistics of the Committee of the State of Women in Islam, on page number 66 and 67, of the year 1975, it says that the polygamous marriages done in India by the Hindus was 5.06% between 1951 and 1961. And the Muslims, the Muslims are allowed by the Indian law to marry more than one woman, the Hindus aren't. Muslims married more than one woman, the percentage was 4.31. Hindus 5.06, by law they aren't allowed. Muslims by law we are allowed and yet 4.31. God knows if the law would have allowed, how many would they have married? So if you analyze, there is no religious scripture on the face of the earth which says marry only one except the glorious Quran. The Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 3 that marry women of a choice in twos, threes or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. This statement marry only one is only given in the glorious Quran and no other religious scripture. The Quran has put an upper limit. Maximum that you can marry is four. You know, before the Quran was revealed, you know, people used to have tens and hundreds of wives. Quran said maximum four. But you can only marry more than one woman if you can do justice. If you can't do justice, marry only one. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter number four, verse number 129, that it is impossible to be just between your wives. I mean, total justice is impossible. But do not turn away from them altogether. That means, you know, here Quran is referring that where it comes to love, it's impossible to be just between two wives. Like a mother, even though she loves all the children, yet she cannot love two children equally. She may say verbally, I love all my children, but if you actually post-mortem her views, you come to know that there has to be that the mother loves one child more than the other. Overall she may love equally, but minutely there has to be a difference. Similarly, a man cannot love two wives or three wives equally. The Quran says it's impossible do justice where love is concerned, etc. But otherwise, where other things are concerned, about money, about time, about other things, other commodity, material things, you should do justice between your wives. And as far as possible, even try doing justice where love is concerned. Even though it's impossible, try your level best. And many people think that marrying more than one wife is compulsory in Islam. If you are a Muslim, you have to marry more than one wife. There are five categories of do's and don'ts in Islam. The first is compulsory, that is fard. The second is mustahab, encouraged. The third is mubah, optional. The fourth is makru, detestable or discouraged. And the fifth is haram, that is prohibited. Polygyny, a Muslim man marrying more than one woman, falls in the middle category of optional. It is not that if you marry more than one woman, you get more sawa. But if you marry more than one woman and if you don't do justice, you are in trouble. So marrying more than one wife in Islam, marrying more than one woman, is optional. Let's analyze the logical reason what we can think of, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His divine wisdom has allowed certain men to have more than one woman. Have more than one woman. By nature, Male and female, they are born in equal proportion. 
male and female, they are born in equal proportion. But when you ask any pediatrician, in the child age itself, in the childhood, the female sex can fight the germs and the disease and the bacteria much better than the male sex. So in the children age group itself, there are more male children dying than the female children. So in the pediatric age itself, you find the population of the females more than the male population. As you grow up, deaths take place due to accidents, cigarette smoking, due to war. In these cases, more males are dying than females. So today in the world, there are more females than males. Only in few countries, like the country where I come from, India, and few other countries, where the female population is less than the male population. And the basic reason for this is, a report that come on the BBC, in the program assignment, the topic was let or die, there was a British reporter by the name of Emily Beckinen who said that every day in India, 3,000 fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they are females. That means more than a million fetuses are being aborted in India after they identified their females. If this evil practice is stopped in India, within a few decades, even in India, the female population will outnumber the male population. Let's analyze the statistics and the ratio of the male-female population throughout the world. In America alone, there are 7.8 million females more than male. In New York alone, there are 1 million female more than male. And today's statistics tell us that the one-third population of New York, they are gays. Gays means sodomites. That means they wouldn't like having female partners. There are more than 25 million gays, sodomites in America, form a loot. That means, if you analyze, there will be 30 million females more than males. In UK alone, there are 4 million females more than males. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females more than males. In Russia alone, there are 9 million females more than males. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone knows how many millions of females are there throughout the world. Even in Singapore, if you check the census, there are bound to be more females in Singapore than males. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone knows how many females are more than males throughout the world. Suppose I agree with the non-Muslim who says that one man should only marry one woman, if I agree with him. And suppose my sister happens to live in America and the market is saturated. Every man has found a wife for himself and the market is saturated. Yet there will be 30 million females who will not find husband. 30 million. If you can find a man who has no wife, grab him. But suppose the market is saturated. If you go to America, market is saturated. That every man has found a woman for himself. Yet there will be 30 million females who will not find husband. Now the only option remaining for these women, and suppose my sister happens to be one of them, or suppose your sister happens to be one of them, the only option remaining is that she either marries a man who already has a wife, or she becomes public property. <laughs> you know, people say, Brother Zakir, public property? What do you mean by public property? I tell them, this is the most sophisticated word I can use. <laughs> I cannot think of a better word, you know, because, you know, I am a die. I have to use good words. I can't use other words, you know. I have to take care of my language. It is the most sophisticated word I can use. And you ask that to any modest woman. But would she prefer marrying a man who already has a wife, not become public property? Any modest woman would opt for the first. But when you go to the Western world, you find there that it's very common practice that they are mistresses. You know, on average, if you see the sites of America, on average, a man has eight different sexual partners before he settles down with one permanent one. Eight. Statistics of America. You know, some may have 20, some may have 30, some may have one. Eight different sexual partners. You know, mistresses are so common. And when a woman becomes a mistress, that means has sexual relationship without the wedlock, you know, she has no protection, she has no rights, she has no honor. All this goes down the throats of the Westerners very easily. But when we say that Islam allows a man to marry more than one woman, they cannot digest it. When a man marries more than one woman, the women both, or three or four, all of them get equal justice, they get honor, they get their rights. And Alhamdulillah, they lead a dignified life. Whereas if you compare it to the mistresses, they are leading a life which is not honorable at all. So Islam has a solution to the problem of the humankind. 
that the reason Islam has allowed some men to marry more than one woman to protect the modesty of the woman, not to degrade her. Some men to marry more than one woman to protect the modesty of the woman, not to degrade her. The second question that can come as a counter question by the non-Muslim is that if Islam has allowed a man to marry more than one woman, why aren't the women allowed to marry more than one man? It's a counter question. Why isn't polyandry allowed in Islam? And Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 24, that do not marry the woman who are already married. That means you cannot marry a woman who is already married. That means a woman cannot have more than one husband at a time. Because if you analyze that if a man has more than one wife and if any children are born out of this wedlock, you can easily identify who the father is and who the mother is. It's very easy. But if a woman has more than one husband, you can easily identify the mother but you will not be able to identify the father. And if suppose the mother goes to school to admit the child and if the teacher asks that what is the name of the father, she may have to give two names. <laughs> you know what such people are called in our society. And today psychologists tell us that if a child cannot identify the parents, the mother and father, he has mental trauma during childhood. That's the reason the children of prostitutes, you know, they have a very bad childhood, mental trauma. So Islam lays a great deal of importance on the identification of the parents. I am aware, being a medical doctor, that today science is advanced and by doing DNA testing and genetic testing, it's possible, many a times, to identify who is the father and the mother. But Islam is a religion for all times. This test just came recently. This test wasn't there before. And it is expensive. It's not possible for everyone to do it. It may become cheap tomorrow. But this reason that you cannot identify the parents is at least applicable till today. But this is not the only reason why Islam has not allowed a woman to have more than one husband. This is one of the reasons which was applicable to today, may not be applicable in the future. There are various other reasons. For example, by nature, man is more polygamous as compared to the woman. Third reason is that it is much more easier for a man to perform his duty biologically and physically of being the husband of multiple wives than a woman to perform her duties biologically and physically of multiple husbands. Let me explain to you that in Islam, a man and woman, they are equal. But equality does not mean identicality. They are equal, but they aren't identical. Physically, biologically, they are different. Overall, they are equal. But in certain aspects, depending upon the biological nature, depending on the physical nature, there are certain rules which are different for men, certain rules different for women, but overall they are equal. And you can refer to my cassette, Women Rights in Islam, for more detail. Now, a woman undergoes menstrual period. There are certain hormonal changes. There are changes in her behavior, in her mental behavior. That's the reason if you know the procedure of divorce, Islam says that during a menstrual cycle you cannot divorce, you know. There are various reasons, etc. So, before the menstrual cycle and during that, there are hormonal changes, there are disturbances. It's difficult for a woman, you know, to maintain a balance. Even as being a wife of one husband, it's possible. But if she has to be a wife of multiple husbands, it will be very difficult. You know, there are mental changes, biological changes, which is not the case in the man. Therefore, biologically and physically, it's possible for a man to be a husband of more than one wife than for a woman to be a wife of more than one husband. And there are other reasons also. Today medical science tells us that if a woman has more than one sexual partner, means if a woman has more than one husband, and if all of these people are faithful to each other, that means they don't have any extramarital sex, yet if a woman has multiple sexual partners, they can be certain diseases, sexual transmitted diseases, diseases of the cervix, which can originate. If a woman has multiple life partners, even if they are faithful to each other. This is not the case in man. And once the disease originates, it can be retransmitted to the husband. Whereas, in the case of a man, if he has multiple sexual partners, two or three, and if all of them are faithful to each other, if they don't have any extramarital sex, 
these diseases don't originate. So these are few of the reasons which I feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine wisdom has prohibited a woman to have more than one husband. The third common question that can be asked by the non-Muslim is that you Muslims, you subjugate the woman by keeping her in the veil. You know, you keep her in the hijab, in the parda, in the veil and you subjugate her. You look down upon her by keeping her in the veil. In fact, Islam is the first religion which gave rights to the woman. And Prophet Muhammad was the major benefactor who uplifted the woman. And if you analyze the history of how women were treated in the previous civilizations, for example, if you read the history of Babylonia, Babylonian civilization, there, if a man murdered a woman, instead of the man punished, the wife of the man was punished. If you read the history of the Greek civilization, the Greeks, they called the woman as the Pandora. Pandora was the name given, as a sign of misfortune. And women in the Greek civilization, she was used only for sex and pleasure. If you read the history of the Roman civilization, there were a lot of nudity and promiscuity amongst the women, and the women were ill-treated. In the Egyptian civilization, the women were considered as the sign of the devil. In the Arab civilization, before the Quran was revealed, the moment a female used to be born, very often she was put to death. Alhamdulillah. After the revelation of the glorious Quran, its evil practice had discontinued in Arabia. Islam, as I said, is the first religion which uplifted the woman. And Prophet Muhammad was the major benefactor. Now, after Islam has given equal rights to the woman, Islam says it is the duty of the woman to maintain the level of modesty. Uplifted the woman, it's their duty to maintain it. And people talk about the hijab, about the veil, you know, the hijab in Islam, etc., and always talk about the hijab of the woman, hijab of the woman. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the glorious Quran, first speaks about the hijab for the man and then of the woman. If you read the Quran, Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, that say to the believing man, that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. That whenever a man looks at a woman, and any brazen thought comes in his mind, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. First, the Quran mentions the hijab of the male. There was once a friend of mine, who was a Muslim, who was staring at a girl for a long time. So I told him, brother, what are you doing? It's not allowed in Islam. So he told me, brother, our beloved prophet said that the first glance is allowed. I have not yet completed half my glance. <laughs> what did the prophet mean when he said that the first dance allowed, the prophet didn't mean that you can look at a woman and without blinking look at her for 10 minutes and then say, you know that my glance is not complete. What the prophet meant that if you look at a woman unintentionally, don't again look at her intentionally and stare at her with an unashamed eye. That doesn't mean you can look at a woman and feast at her for a long time. That's what the prophet meant. Intentionally don't look at her again. Don't feast on her beauty, etc. The next verse of the glorious Quran, Surah Nur chapter 24, verse number 31, speaks about the hijab for the woman. It says, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. And display not the beauty except what appears ordinarily of. And draw her veil, a head covering over the bosom. Except in front of her husband, her father, her son, and a big list of mehram, the close relatives which she can't marry is given. Among these people she can relax her hijab. Otherwise, amongst all the other people she should maintain the hijab. And the criteria for hijab is given in the glorious Quran, as well as the Sahih Hadith, that basically there are six criteria. The first is the extent which differs between the man and the woman. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. Some scholars say that even this should be covered. But the minimum is that the complete body should be covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be so tight that it reveals the figure. The third is, it should not be transparent so that you can see through. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. You cannot wear clothes that resemble, which are signs 
which identity of unbelievers like cross sign of Christianity Om sign of Hinduism and the last is you should not wear clothes that which resembles the opposite sex you know you have in the western country people wearing one earring you know? men wearing one earring it has certain indication one earring all this not allowed in Islam and the reason for hijab for the woman has been described in the glorious Quran in Surah Ahzab chapter number 33 verse number 59 which says O Prophet tell your wives and the believing women that when they go abroad they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested so the Quran says that hijab has been prescribed for the women so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested I want to ask you a question let suppose there are two sisters who are twins and who are equally beautiful, they are very beautiful and they are walking down the streets of Singapore one is wearing the Islamic hijab complete body covered except the face and the handle of the wrist and the second sister she is wearing the western clothes the skirt or the mini and when they are walking down the streets of Singapore around the corner there is a hooligan there is a ruffian who is waiting for a catch who is going to tease a girl I am asking a question which girl will he tease? will he tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab? Or will it tease the girl wearing the skirt of the mini? Which girl will it tease? Which one will it tease? The one wearing the skirt of the mini, but natural. So Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed so that it will prevent them from being molested. You know the western world, they talk about women's liberalization. The western talk of women's liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of her body, of deprivation of honor and degradation of her soul. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her to the status of a concubine, of a mistress, of society but of life, which are mere tools in the hands of sex marketers and pleasure seekers which are hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. Islam has uplifted the woman and I said it's their duty to maintain their status. That is the reason that Islam prescribes hijab to maintain the modest of the woman, not to degrade or to subjugate her. The other common question asked by the non muslim is, I have placed it number four, is that when Islam is a religion of peace, how come it was spread by the sword? You know, Islam is a religion of peace. Then how come it was spread by the sword? Islam comes from the root word salam, as I mentioned, which means peace. It also means submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Almighty God. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam is a religion which wants to spread peace throughout the world. But there are some people, some human beings, who do not want peace to prevail in the world for their own benefits. You know, so that they can have certain benefits for their own material desires. And we know there are such people. To prevent such people, you may even have to use force. That is the reason that the police many a times use this force on the criminals to spread peace. So sometimes you may have to use force to let peace prevail in the world. Similarly, Islam is a religion of peace, but sometimes it says that when there are some people who prevent the spreading of the peace, you can use force to put them in the place so that the peace can prevail in the world. The best reply to this question posed by non-Muslims that Islam was spread by the is given by a very famous historian by the name of Dilesi O'Leary in the book Islam at the Crossroad on page number 8. And he says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastically absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. You know we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. We didn't use the sword. Later on the crusaders came and they wiped out the Muslims. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the Adhan. We didn't use the sword. We Muslims, Alhamdulillah, we were the masters 
of Arabia for the past 1400 years. The Arabs, the ruling Arabia, for the past 1400 years. For a few years the British came, for a few years the French came, but overall we were ruling Arabia and still Alhamdulillah ruling for the past 1400 years. And do you know today, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means the Christian since birth, since generation. The fathers, the forefathers are Christian. 14 million Coptic Christians you have today who are Arabs. If the Muslims wanted, we could have converted each and every Arab at the point of the sword. These 14 million Coptic Christians or Arabs, they are bearing witness that Islam wasn't spread by the sword. India, the country where I come from, do you know that the Muslims, we ruled India for a thousand years. If we wanted, we could have converted each and every non-Muslim at the point of the sword. But we didn't do it. You know today, there are more than 80% Indians who are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslim Indian, they are giving shahada. They are bearing witness that Islam wasn't spread by the sword. Today the country which has the maximum population of Muslims is Indonesia. I am asking you the question, which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? Thomas Carlyle, who is a famous historian, he gives the reply. Sword. Indeed it is the sword. You have to get the sword. Every new opinion initially originates in the mind of one. One man against the whole world. In one man mind it dwells alone. It will do little good that it takes the sword and tries to spread it. You have to get your sword. Which sword is talking about? Even if you had the metal sword, you could not use it. Because the Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 256, like Rahafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. You have to present the truth to them. You cannot force anyone to convert the point of the sword or the point of the gun. You have to present the truth. If they accept it, Alhamdulillah, if they don't accept it, no problem. The sword which Thomas Carlyle is talking about is the sword of the intellect. As the Glorious Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, It is invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best for the Christian. It is the sword of wisdom, sword of hikmah, sword of intellect. There was an article which came in the Plain Truth Magazine. It was a reproduction of an article which came in the Reader Digest al Yearbook, 1986. And it gave the statistics of the increase of the major world religion between 1934 to 1984. In the span of 50 years, it gave the increase of the major world religion. Number one was Islam. 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I am asking the question, which war took place between 1934 and 1984, which converted millions of people to Islam? Which war? Which war? Today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I am asking you, which sword is asking these Westerners to revert to Islam? Which sword? Who is forcing them today? The fastest growing religion in America and Europe today is Islam. Dr. Adam Pearson says, he gives a very good reply. The people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was born. The fifth common question that can be posed is, you Muslims, you all are fundamentalists, you all are terrorists. All you Muslims are fundamentalists and terrorists. How do you reply to such a question posed by non-Muslims? What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? A fundamentalist is a person who follows the fundamentals. For example, for a person to be a good mathematician, he should know, he should follow and practice the fundamentals of maths. He should be a fundamentalist in the field of maths to be a good mathematician. For a person to be a good scientist, he should know, he should follow and practice the fundamentals of science. He should be a fundamentalist in the field of science 
to be a good scientist. For a person to be a good doctor, he should know, he should follow and practice the fundamentals of medicine. He should be a fundamentalist in the field of medicine to be a good doctor. You cannot paint all fundamentalists as good or all fundamentalists as bad. You have to analyze in which field are they fundamentalists in. For example, you may have a fundamentalist robber who is expert in robbing, who has made a lifestyle as robbing. Is he good or bad? For the society is harmful. He is a bad person. On the other hand, you have a fundamentalist doctor who knows his medicine very well. He treats the people. He cures hundreds of people. And he prevents many people from dying. He is a fundamentalist doctor. Is he good or bad for society? He is beneficial for the society. He is a good fundamentalist. So you can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush. The all of them are good, all of them are bad. Depending on which field are they a fundamentalist in. Alhamdulillah. I am a fundamentalist Muslim. I know. I follow. And Alhamdulillah, the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. I am a fundamentalist Muslim. And I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. You know why? Because I know that each and every teaching of Islam is beneficial for the whole of humankind. There is not a single teaching of Islam which any human being on the face of the earth can show me which is detrimental to the human race as a whole. And some people may think, ah, this teaching is not good because of the misconception of Islam. You may think, ah, this particular aspect of Islam not to have spoke. Oh, it's not correct. Because they don't have in-depth knowledge. But anyone who is unbiased and has correct knowledge cannot show me a single teaching of Islam which is against humanity. Therefore, Alhamdulillah, I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. And every Muslim to be a good Muslim, he should be a fundamentalist. Then only will be a good Muslim. The moment anyone says that a fundamental Muslim, no, 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 we aren't fundamentalists. What do you want? You have to be a fundamentalist. If you are not a fundamentalist Muslim, you are not a Muslim at all. That means you are a pseudo-Muslim. You know, many people, they are apologetic. Anyone attacks you, you go on the defense. No, 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 I am not a fundamentalist. No, those other people, I am not. I am a good Muslim. How can you be a good Muslim and not a fundamentalist? You have to be a fundamentalist to be a good Muslim. Fundamentalist in the field of Islam. Now, when you look up the meaning of the word fundamentalism in the Webster Dictionary, it will tell you that fundamentalism was a movement which started in the early part of the 20th century by a group of Protestant Christians who protested that people first said that the teaching of the Bible is the word of God. But these people protested not only are the teaching, but every letter, every word of the Bible is verbatim the word of God. So fundamentalism was a word used first time to describe the movement started by a group of Protestant American Christians who said that every word in the Bible is the word of God. If anyone can prove that the Bible is a God's word, then it's a good movement. But on the other hand, if anyone can prove that Bible is not the word of God, it's not a good movement. But when you look up the meaning of the word fundamentalist, in the Oxford Dictionary, it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to ancient teachings or doctrine, especially Islam. Especially Islam is there in the Oxford Dictionary. So the moment you hear the word fundamentalist, you think of a Muslim. The moment you hear the word fundamentalist, immediately at the back of your mind, because I've read the Oxford Dictionary, it has to be a Muslim. And immediately you start thinking, oh, fundamentalist. Terrorist. Along with the word fundamentalist, the word terrorist is also attached. If he is a Muslim, he has to be a fundamental, has to be a terrorist. I tell my non-Muslim friends and my brothers, that do you know, it's a duty of every Muslim to be a terrorist. He is shocked. What is Zakir saying? That every Muslim should be a terrorist. Now I try and explain to him, what is the meaning of the word terrorist? A terrorist is a person who causes terror. You know the policeman, whenever a robber sees a policeman, he is terrified. The policeman is a terrorist for the robber. Right or wrong? He is. In the same way, every Muslim should be a terrorist for the anti-social element. Whenever any anti-social element looks at a Muslim, if he is a Muslim, he should be terrified. Any rapist, any robber, any thief, when he looks at a Muslim, he should be terrified. Ah, this Muslim, no, they will put me behind bars. 
Every Muslim should be a terrorist for the anti-social element. I am aware that the word terrorist is more commonly used for causing terror to the innocent people. In that context, no Muslim should ever be a terrorist. He should not at all terrify any innocent person. He should be a selective terrorist. Terrorist only to the anti-social element. Many a times, the activity of one particular individual is given two different labels. Same person, same activity, but two different labels given by two different groups of people. So let me give you an example. You know, India, previously, it was being ruled by the British government. You know, they came for doing business, but they started ruling India for a couple of centuries. There were many Indians who prescribed to the violent method to try and acquire freedom. Now these people who tried to free India, these Indians, who tried to free India, by the British government they were called as terrorists. But the same Indians, by the Indians they were called as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. One group is calling them as terrorists, the other group is calling them as patriots, as freedom fighters. So before you give a label to any particular individual, you have to first analyze the background. If you agree with the view of the British government that Britain had a right to rule India, then you will call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the Indians that the British people, they only came to business, you know, and then they ended up ruling us for hundreds of years, they had no right to rule us. If you agree with their view, then you will call the same people, the same individual as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people. Same activity, two different labels. Therefore, before you label anyone, try and analyze the background. And then give your view. So in this context, in the correct context, every Muslim should be a fundamentalist Muslim and should be a terrorist to the anti-social element. Should be a terrorist to the anti-social element. The other question. The sixth common question that can be asked is that you Muslims, you know, you all are ruthless people. You all are merciless people. You know, you all have non-veg. You all kill animals. You know, you should be vegetarian. Why do you have non-veg? You know, killing the animals, you know, poor living creatures, killing them. You all are ruthless people. And this question is more often posed by Indians, which Alhamdulillah now you find them throughout the world. There are many non-Muslim Indians who are pure vegetarian and they say that, you know, why are your Muslims so ruthless? Why do you kill the animals, etc.? I would like to mention that a Muslim can be a very good Muslim even by being a pure vegetarian. He can be. If he wants to be a good Muslim, he can be a good Muslim even by being a pure vegetarian. But the question is, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us permission to have non-veg, why should we not have non-veg? That's the basic question. Allah says in the glorious Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 1, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amunu. O you who believe, lawful for you are all four-footed animal with the exception name. Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 5, that Allah has created for you cattle and from it you derive warmth. And in it are various benefits and of the meat you can eat. Quran says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 21, that verily in the cattle is a lesson for you. We give you to drink from what is within the body. And from it, you derive various benefits. And of the meat, you can eat. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us permission to have non-veg, why should we not have non-veg? And if you analyze that meat, it's rich in protein, it's rich in iron, it's rich in vitamin B1, it's rich in niacin, it's nutritious. In fact, in the vegetables, you will not find a good quality protein at all in the vegetables. And if you analyze the set of teeth of the herbivorous animal, the cow, the goat, the sheep, if you look at the set of teeth, they have a flat set of teeth. If you analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animal, the tiger, the leopard, the lion, they have got pointed teeth. They have canine teeth. If you go in the mirror and look 
as our set of teeth, the human being. We have pointed teeth as well as flat teeth. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did He give us this pointed teeth? For what? We have non veg. If He wanted us to have only vegetables, He would have given us a flat set of teeth. We look in the mirror every time, but we don't realize that. Allah has shown us signs. And if you analyze the digestive system of the herbivorous animal, the cow, the goat, the sheep, they can only digest vegetables. They cannot digest non veg. The digestive system of the carnivorous animal, the lion, the tiger, the leopard, they can only digest non veg, they cannot digest vegetables. But the digestive system of the human being can digest veg as well as non veg. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, wanted us to have only vegetables, why did He give us a digestive system which can digest both veg as well as non veg? But natural to have it. If you analyze, many Hindus who say that we are pure vegetarian, if you read their scriptures, it's mentioned in the scriptures that the sages, the saints, they had non veg. And if you read the Ayodhya Khandam, chapter number 20, chapter 26, as well as chapter number 94, it says that when Ram was sent for Banwas, he told his mother that I will have to sacrifice my tasty meat dishes. When Ram said that he will have to sacrifice the tasty meat dishes, that means he had meat. When Ram can have meat, why can't you have meat? Many people may not know the finer details of Ram, man, but they know the broad outline. And surely they know the story that when Ram was sent for Banwas, along with him went his wife Sita. And one day Sita asked Ram to kill the buck, the deer. The question I want to pose them is, that why did Sita ask Ram to kill the buck? Why? Why did Sita ask Ram to kill the deer? There will be some Hindus who will say that Sita wanted a pet. <laughs> I asked them, what will Sita do with a dead pet? <laughs> if she wants a pet, it should be a life pet. The only reason that Sita told Ram to kill the buck was to have its meat. When Ram and Sita can have meat, why can't you and I have meat? So if you analyze the Hindu scriptures, do give permission for a person to have non-veg, but later on, because of the influence of the other religions, like Jainism, etc., to prevent people from adopting their way of life, they started adopting vegetarianism. And when you ask these people who believe in pure vegetarianism, that, why don't you have non-veg? So they say, that see, eating non-veg is a sin. You ask them, why? See, because killing living creatures is a crime. By having non-veg, you are killing animals, you are killing living creatures. So I tell them, Alhamdulillah. If a person can survive in this world without killing living creatures, I would be the first one to follow it. You know, because what they say about plants, today science tells us that even plants are living creatures. Previously, they did not know about that. Previously, they thought that plants weren't living creatures. Even plants have good life. So the logic has changed. The logic has changed. And even when you breathe in, you breathe in germs, which are living organisms. You cannot survive for five minutes without killing living organisms. So now the logic has changed. See, the plants are living creatures, but the plants, they can't feel pain. Therefore, killing a plant is a lesser crime as compared to killing animals. <laughs> Very good logic. The plants can't feel pain. Today, science tells us that the plants can even feel pain. They can even cry. They can even feel happy. Do you know that? But the cry of the plant cannot be heard by the human ear. Because the human ear can only hear between frequency of 20 cycles per second, to 20,000 cycles per second. Anything below or above this, the human ear can't hear. Have you heard of the silent dog whistle? The master whistles, and the dog comes running, but the human beings can't hear. Because the dog can hear up to 40,000 cycles per second. So the whistle that the master blows is between 20,000 cycles per second to 40,000 cycles per second. The human beings can't hear, but the dog hears and comes running to the master. There was a farmer in America who converted the cry of the plants to the human audible level. And you could immediately come to know when did the plant cry, if it had any problems, it required water. So even the today's science say that the plants can even feel pain, they can even cry, but you cannot hear their pain. And there was a non-Muslim who had a maximum argument with me, and he told me that, see Brother Zakir, I agree with you, that in the plants, they have got life, they can feel pain, but in the plants, have got only three senses. Animals have got five senses. 
Therefore, killing animal is a greater crime. So I told him, okay, for sake of argument, I agree with you. For sake of argument, I agree with you. The plants have got three senses, animal has got five senses. So I asked him, my dear brother, suppose you have a younger brother who is born deaf and dumb. Can't hear, can't speak, two senses less. After he grows up, there is a man who comes and kills him. So will you go and tell the judge, oh me lord, give the murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses less. <laughs> will you go and tell like that? In fact, you will go and tell the judge, me lord, give this criminal a bigger punishment because they have killed a masoom. They have killed an innocent person who couldn't even fight back. So Islamic logic doesn't work like that, two senses or three senses or five senses. Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 168, that eat of the good things that we have provided you. What is good, you can have. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine wisdom, He knows what our requirement is. Therefore, if you analyze, if you analyze, that if suppose I agree with non-Muslim, that everyone should be a pure vegetarian. Everyone. Do you know the world will be overpopulated with cattle? Because the gestation period of the cattle is very small. You kill a million, another million will be born. So if you stop having them, we have a problem of overpopulation of human beings. From tomorrow we'll have overpopulation of cattle. You know, Allah has made them in such a way that the gestation period is small and the reproduction is very fast. And personally, if a non-Muslim doesn't have non-veg, I've got no problem. I'm happy in fact. I'll tell you the reason. But if he comes and tells me, that brother Zakir, why do you have non-veg? Then there's a problem. I tell them, why I shouldn't have? If he doesn't have non-veg, I'm happy. You know why? Because suppose every Indian non-Muslim starts having non-veg, then the price of the meat will go high. So, you know, I may have to pay more money. So where it comes to non-Muslim not having non-veg, I've got no problem. But when he comes and interferes with me and says, you're doing something wrong, then I explain to him the reason. Then there may be some non-Muslims, question number seven, that you know what you eat has an effect on your behavior. Whatever you eat, today science tells us, whatever you eat has an effect on your behavior. You Muslims, you eat animals and you behave like animals. You are Muslims are violent and ruthless, you know. And today science says that what you eat has an effect on your behavior. You all are ruthless people. I tell to these non-Muslims, I agree with you, brother. I agree with you that whatever you eat, has an effect on your behavior. Science has said that and I agree with it. That's the reason we Muslims, we are not allowed to have carnivorous animal, we are only allowed to have herbivorous animal like cow, goat, sheep, you know, which are peaceful animal, docile animal, and we are peace loving people. <laughs> we aren't allowed to have tiger, leopard, you know, who are ferocious and violent. We only have peaceful animals. And the glorious Quran says that you have to follow the commandments of the beloved Prophet. It's mentioned for Araf chapter number 7, verse number 157, that the messenger commands you that which is just and forbids you that which is evil. The Prophet allows you that which is good for you and prohibits you that which is impure for you. It's again repeated in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 7, that take what the Prophet assigns to you and abstain from that which he denies you. And there are several Sahih Hadith in Sahih Muslim, in Sahih Bukhari, in which the Prophet has clearly mentioned that you should not have carnivorous animals. And he gives a list of prohibited food. The first is the carnivorous animal, which have got canine teeth, you know, like cat, dog, hyena, leopard, lion, etc. You can't have certain rodents like rat, mice, rabbits with claws, you can't have certain reptiles like poisonous snakes, alligators, etc. You can't have birds of prey which have got talons and claws like vultures, owls, eagles. All these category is prohibited for the Muslims. So what the Prophet says we believe. Atiullah wa Rasul. Therefore we are only allowed to have herbivorous animals, the cattle which are peace loving. Allowed to have herbivorous animals, the cattle which are peace loving. There are some non-Muslims who do have non-veg, but they say, you know you Muslims, you have non-veg, no problem. 
But why do you kill the animal in such a ruthless manner? You know, kill him with mercy. You all torture him to death. You kill the animal rithers and kicks and bleeds to death. You all are merciless people, you Muslims. You want to have non-veg? We have no objection. But at least kill the animal mercifully. Why do you torture him to death? Once there was an argument going on between a Muslim and a Sikh. You know, Sikh is a person from India who has a turban. They were having an argument. Same argument. You Muslims, you all are ruthless people. You all torture the animal, etc. So our Muslim brother, he used his hikmah, and he said that we Muslims, you know, we do zabiha, you know why? You all Sikhs, you all are coward people, you all attack from behind. We Muslims, we are brave, marat ka bacha, we attack from the front. <laughs> no, because the Sikhs, when they slaughter the animal, they give zhatka, fat, one shot and animal dies. So the Muslims said, you all are coward, attacking from behind. We are marat ka bacha, we attack from the front. Anyway, this is not the reason why we do Zabiha. This was just a joke. <laughs> this is just a joke which has taken place really. But this is not the reason why we do Zabiha. The reason why we Muslims do Zabiha, and Zabiha has been derived from Zaka or Taskia, we need to purify, to grow. And there are various rules and regulations of Zabiha. We can give a talk only on the rules and regulations. But the major ones are that, you know, that the knife should be sharp, it should be a swift cut. And there are many that you should give water to the animal before slaughtering it. You should not slaughter one animal in front of the other, various areas. But the main scientific reason is that you also cut the throat and the windpipe and the vessels of the neck, the jugular vein and the carotid artery. When you do zabiha, you cut the throat, windpipe and the vessels of neck without damaging the spinal cord. Because if the spinal cord is damaged, the nerve going to the heart may get severed, may get cut, they may be cardiac arrest. The blood will stagnate in the body. So when we do Zabiya, we cut the windpipe, throat and vessels of neck and the heart is yet pumping. The animal doesn't die immediately. And most of the blood flows out. The reason why we let the blood flow out of the body is because today we have come to know that blood is a good media of germ and bacteria and toxin. We are hygienic people. We let majority of the blood flow out of the body. If we have, along with the meat, the blood, it contains germs, bacteria, toxins. And if we slaughter give one jatka, the blood remains, which is not good for health. And besides that, meat which is slaughtered by Zabiha method remains fresh for longer time because of lack of blood, as compared to meat slaughtered by jatka or, or by stunning method. And alhamdulillah, you know, Last time I came to Singapore, I was very happy that the McDonald's, you know, halal, Pizza Hut, halal, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, you know, there there are problems in the Western world, you know. You can't have the meat from these people. Alhamdulillah, I was very happy. And hardly 15 to 18 percent Muslims, Alhamdulillah. That's it. Even the non-Muslims have realized that that's the most scientific method. If you compare, which is more merciful? The stunning method or the Zabiha method? Scientific research tells us today, that the Zabiha method is more merciful. You know why? Because when you do Zabiha, the blood supply going to the nerve, which is responsible for feeling the pain, is stopped. So the animal does not feel pain. The animal kicks and rithers because of lack of blood. When the blood flows out of the body, the animal kicks and rithers. When there is less blood in the arm, the muscles will contract and relax. The legs will start contracting and relaxing. So the animal kicks and rithers not due to pain, due to lack of blood in that part of the body. Due to gush or flow of blood. The animal does not feel pain. It dies a merciful death. As compared to stunning, many a time when the first shot is given, the animal doesn't die, and the animal actually later on dies after a long time with crucial pain. So even scientifically, the Zabiha method is much more merciful as compared to the stunning method. the main non-Muslims who may ask question number 9 that you all Muslims say that idol worship is not allowed it is haram then why do you all bow to the Kaaba? you all worship the Kaaba the stone which is maximum worship is the Kaaba why do you all bow to the Kaaba? people are against idol worship no Muslim ever worships the Kaaba no Muslim we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Kaaba is our Qibla it is the direction it is the Qibla direction in which we pray because we Muslims believe in unity. 
and if suppose we offer salah in this hall, some may say let's pray towards the north, some may say let's face south, some may say east, which direction will we face? So for unity, every Muslim faces towards the Kaaba. If you are living on the north side of Kaaba, you face towards the south. If you are living on west of Kaaba, you face towards the east. If you are living on the east of Kaaba, you face towards the west. Whichever part of the world you are, you face towards the Kaaba. That's the Kibla. And the first people who drew the map, the geography map, were the Muslims. You know, they had the South Pole on the top and North Pole down at the bottom. And Alhamdulillah, Kaaba was in the center. Wherever I want to pray, face towards the center of the earth. The Westerners came and they turned the map upside down. North Pole on top, South Pole down. But yet, Alhamdulillah, Kaaba is yet in the center. <laughs> Kaaba is our Qibla. And when we go for Hajj and Umrah, when we do Tawaf around the Kaaba, we circumambulate around the Kaaba. The reason we circumambulate around the Kaaba is to testify, as we know, that every circle has got only one center. A circle cannot have two centers. So we circumambulate around the Kaaba to testify that there is only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is only one God. And the best answer was given by the second Khalifa of Islam, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, poem number 2, in the book of Hajj, chapter number 56, hadith number 675, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said that I am kissing this black stone, kissing this black stone, because my Prophet kissed it. Otherwise, this black stone can neither benefit me, neither can cause me harm. Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said, this black stone can neither benefit me, can neither cause me harm, I am only touching and kissing it because my beloved Prophet did it. This statement of the second Khalifa of Islam, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, is sufficient to prove that we Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. And another point that can be told to the non-Muslim is that during the time of the Prophet, the Sahabas used to stand on the Kaaba and give the Azan. I am asking you, which idol worshipper will ever stand on the idol which he worships? Any idol worshipper stand on the idol worship? Never. So this is sufficient proof that we Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. Any idol worshipper stand on the idol worship? Never. So this is sufficient proof that we Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. The tenth question, which is a common question, is that when Islam is a universal religion, why don't you allow non-Muslims to enter Makkah and Medina? It's a common question. I happen to be an Indian. Even though I'm an Indian, there are certain areas in India which are known as cantonment area. Every country has certain cantonment area, known as the military area, you know, where only those people involved with the difference of the country, they are allowed. I'm a citizen of India, but I'm not allowed to go in the cantonment area. Why? Only those people who are involved with defense of the country, they are allowed there. No one else. Similarly, the Harmain, Makkah and Medina, they are the cantonment area of the Muslims. You know, Islam is for the full world. But only those people who are involved in protecting and fighting and defending Islam, only they are allowed in the cantonment area of Makkah and Medina. And Allah gives a promise in the glorious Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 28, from this day, do not allow the non-believers to enter Makkah and Medina, the Harmain, the sacred places. And furthermore, whenever you visit any country, you require a visa. Any country you want to go, you have to apply for a visa. Without visa, you cannot enter. And USA is a country which is the most difficult to get a visa, especially for third world country people. No? And when you apply for the visa, they ask you several questions. Question number one, two, three, you have to reply. And then judging on that, they will either refuse your visa or grant you visa. You know, when I came to Singapore, I had to apply for a visa. Last moment, you know, visa, visa. They are formalities. Last time when I had come two years back, when I filled the immigration form, this time I didn't fill, I don't know what's the new form. But last time when I came to Singapore, I filled the immigration form, it mentioned death to drug traffickers. Death to drug traffickers. I cannot say, oh, death penalty, barbaric law. If I don't believe in it, I don't enter Singapore. If I want to enter Singapore, I have to agree with the law. That if I'm carrying drugs, I'll be put to death. I can't say, oh, drug penalty, very barbaric law, I don't agree. Don't agree, don't come. <laughs> See, there are visa formalities. You have to agree. If you want to enter Singapore, if you're carrying drugs, you'll be put to death. You can't argue. The visa, visa requirements. 
Similarly, for entering Makkah and Madinah, you require a visa. The visa to enter Makkah and Madinah is to say with your lips, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon me, the Messenger of Allah. If you say this, then no one can deny you entering to Makkah and Madinah. That's a visa. Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon me, the Messenger of Allah. If you say this, then no one can deny you entering to Makkah and Madinah. That's a visa. I've only covered 10 questions, half of the questions, and the time is running short. The three, four minutes are remaining. I will just go to the last two questions, which are short. I've covered 10 questions, the remaining, if you wish, you can ask in question as the time. I've got about 1 hour, 15 minutes to 1 and a half hour to speak on. I'll just go to the 19th and 20th questions, which are small and which are related. I've finished 10 questions. I'll just skip the 8 questions and go to the last two questions, which are short. The answers are short. And the 19th question is, that, you know, Islam is such a beautiful religion. You spoke so good thing about Islam. But the Muslims, they are dishonest. You know, they cheat. And they do illegal activities. So when Islam is such a good religion, but the Muslims, you know, they are the worst people. How do you reply? How do you reply to such an allegation? The main reason that this atmosphere has been created that Muslims are robbers and cheats and ruthless people is again by the media. You know, the media, the Westerners, they are afraid of Islam. The religion that can take Europe today, the only religion that can take is Islam. No other religion. They are afraid of Islam. So they are projecting Islam in the wrong way. You know, they are controlling the media. And you see that whenever any bomb blast takes place, first person, Muslim. With the Oklahoma bomb blast, it took place. Middle East conspiracy. Later on, they came to know it was an American soldier. <laughs> but the news of Muslims as fundamentalist terrorists will come on front page, and when they prove wrong, it comes inside, you know. <laughs> you know, they make a big, it has to be a Muslim, has to be a Muslim. For weeks together, when they find the real culprit, only one day it will come in small news, you know, that, okay, it wasn't a Muslim. You know, when in India, suppose, Muslim, if he marries a 15-year-old girl, a 50-year-old man marries a 15-year-old girl, it comes head page, headline, front page, 50-year-old man marrying a 15-year-old girl, with permission, with permission, comes in front page, he is taking permission of the girl, of the parents, but front page, when a non-Muslim, 50-year-old man rapes a 6-year-old girl, it comes in news briefs, <laughs> news briefs and inside pages, you know, Small, only one paragraph. A 50-year-old man raped a 6-year-old girl. <laughs> this is controlled by the media. The media projects Islam in the wrong way. I am aware that there are black sheep in the community. Every community has a black sheep. Even in a Muslim, Alhamdulillah, I do know. I do know that there are black sheep in the community. I do know that there are Muslims who are dishonest. I do know there are Muslims who cheat. I do know Muslims who can drink the non-Muslim under the table. They can have alcohol much more. They can have more number of pegs, more number of bottles than non-Muslims. I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that. But the media picks up these Muslim black sheep and projects them as exemplary Muslims. They pick up a black sheep and say, all Muslims are like that. See, if Hitler insinuated six million Jews, can I blame Christianity for that? Can I? Hitler insinuated six million Jews. Can I say Christianity did that? No. So the media picks up these black sheep and project them as exemplary Muslims. If you analyze as a whole, as a whole, Muslims as a whole in the world, we are the biggest community of teetotalers which don't imbibe alcohol. Do you know that? Biggest community as a whole which don't imbibe alcohol. We are the biggest community as a whole which gives the maximum charity in the world. There is not a non-Muslim who can show the Muslims even a candle as far as sobriety is concerned, as far as modesty is concerned, as far as human values are concerned, as far as ethics are concerned. There is not a non-Muslim who can show the candle, as a whole. They pick up samples, black sheep, and they project as though they are exemplary. For example, suppose you want to test a new model Mercedes, you know, a new model has come out of the market, the latest 1998 maybe, a new model E200, the latest 98 model has come out, and you want to check the Mercedes Benz, how good it is. You ask a person to sit behind a steering wheel who doesn't know how to drive. He goes and bangs up the car. Who will you blame, the car or the driver? Who will you blame? The car or the driver? The driver! The driver didn't know how to drive the car and he banged up the car. 
Similarly, if you want to judge Islam, don't judge by the followers. Judge by the authentic source, the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Judge by Quran and Sahih Hadith and you'll come to know there's no religion better than Islam. And if you want to put a driver, put an expert driver. If you want to judge Islam by any follower, the best exemplary Muslim is our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is the best example. No wonder non-Muslims, many non-Muslims have paid tribute to him. If you have read the book by Michael H. Hart, the hundred most influential people in the world, right from Adam, peace be upon him, till the present time, he gave number one to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one. Though being a non-Muslim, he was honest. Thomas Carlyle has praised the Prophet. There are hundreds of them. So if you want to judge Islam by the followers, the best exemplary Muslim is the beloved Prophet. By the followers, the best exemplary Muslim is the beloved Prophet. And the last question, the answer is short, that many non-Muslims say, that why do you Muslims abuse us by calling kafir? Why do you abuse us by calling us kafir? And the answer is very short. That kafir comes from the root word kuf, which means to reject, to conceal. In the Islamic perspective, kafir means a person who rejects the truth of Islam. The Arabic word kafir means one who rejects the truth of Islam. If you want to translate into English, it means non-Muslim. So when non-Muslim says that why do you abuse us by calling us kafir, I am saying kafir is the Arabic translation of non-Muslim. If you really feel bad and you feel that I should not call you a kafir, all you have to do is accept Islam. <laughs> and I'll stop calling you a kafir. These were 12 of the 20 most common questions. I'll just briefly mention the remaining 8 questions which I didn't touch. Due to shortage of time, I know the time is up for my talk. I'll just briefly mention the eight questions which I have not covered. The most 20 common questions, otherwise I have a list of more questions. The question I didn't cover up is that why do Muslims don't have pork? Why is pork prohibited in Islam? Why is the consumption of alcohol prohibited in Islam? That's question number 11th and 12th. Question number 13th is that why are two women witnesses equal to one witness of man? Question number 14 is that when Islam believes in equality, why does the woman inherit half the share of the male counterpart? Number 15, can you prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Can you prove the existence of Almighty God? Number 16 is, can you prove that there is life after death? Number 17 is, that Islam talks about unity, but there are so many sects in Islam, you are divided amongst yourself. And the 18th one is, that all the religion basically speak about good things. Then why follow only Islam? You can follow any religion. These were the eight questions which time didn't permit me to cover up. Inshallah, if you have any other questions, they're most welcome to ask. If anyone wants to know the answer to these questions, also they're most welcome to come on the mic and ask the question. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, which says, Udu ila sabili hasna wa jadil billati ahasan. That is, invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and gracious. Without much further ado, um, there are mics on the aisles. I will suggest that if you want to ask a question, rather than to wait for me, you can queue up yeah, and then be able to post a question. Just give me your name and be concise to the topic. Uh, if there is a misconception on the misconception of Islam, then I'll tell you you're out of the out of line. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes. My name is Zaini, and I would like to ask one question regarding about the Bible and the Quran itself. Which is, um, can you prove in the Bible and the Quran? Which is in the Quran it says that you should say that Islam is a religion of peace. So why is it why Allah saying that um, He curses the the Jews itself, whereas in the Bible it doesn't state that, that it curses the, the Arabs, for instance. So that's my question. So we ask a question that as compared to Quran and Bible, in the Quran, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses the Jews. And in the Bible, you don't find that God Almighty is cursing the Arabs. Whether if you analyze and read the Quran, that 
suppose anyone makes a mistake, it's the duty of the teacher to correct that person. And if he's at fault, that person requires a scolding. So if you read the Quran, the Quran in several places gives examples of the Jews. The Jews were the chosen people. Jews were the chosen people. If you analyze in the glorious Quran, 25 prophets are mentioned by name. Majority of them, most of them, they are Jewish prophets. Jewish prophets. You will find very few which are non-Jewish. So Jews were the chosen people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, I have given you so much ni'amat, I have chosen you. Yet you do not do the job. So Allah gives the answer. In Surah Muhammad, chapter 47, verse number 38, Allah says, Wa inta the wallah. Yes, tab the common gairakum. Summa laikunam salakum. If you do not do the job, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa laikunam salakum. And they will not be like you. So Allah says, the Jews were the chosen people. They didn't do the job. Allah said, you go out and bring the other people. Now, the Arabs were looked down by the Jews. The Jews looked down the Arabs. These people, these ignorant people, what will they tell us something? What's the use of telling them about the religion? So Allah says, those who you look down upon, Allah makes those people to sit on your head. And the Arabs which are ignorant people, Allah by the religion of the Quran, made them the torch bearers. So, those who do not follow the instruction, Allah says, don't be like them. Allah says, go to the scandal monger. Allah doesn't only curse the Jews, Allah curses all the people who are wrong. Like for example, Surah Humza. Chapter 104, verse number 1. Why lulli Go to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter, irrespective of whichever religion he follows. Even if he's so-called Muslim, if he backbites, Allah says, go to them, curse them. Anyone who doesn't follow Allah's commandment, abstains and goes against Allah's commandment, Allah doesn't like them. The question is, why didn't God Almighty in the Bible curse the Arabs? Because when the Injil was being revealed, Injil is the wahi which was given to Isa alayhi salam, and Torah is the Wahi which we believe, which was given to Musa alayhi salam. The present Bible is not the Torah or the Injil which we believe in. It's not an original form. But whatever form it's in, yet at that time, the Arabs were not the chosen people. When Arabs were not the chosen people, how can you curse them? How can God curse them? For example, I'm a teacher and I've taught hundred people, you know, of people living in Bombay, you know. And suppose, if you don't know subject well, how can I come and curse the Singaporeans? You are not those people who are attending my class. So similarly, Allah chooses the Jews. So when He has chosen the Jews at that time, the Arabs were not the chosen people. So the question of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursing them doesn't arise. But otherwise in the Bible, Allah curses many other people. Many other people who have done wrong. Hope that answers the question. Yes, sister. Why Islam is, uh, as you mentioned earlier, is a fastest growing religion. Being a Chinese, we talk about the square. Square means the four corners of the world. And I do not know who have created this symbol. And Islam is a double square. So it's inevitable, no matter what the West try to do, there's no way they can do anything. Because from day one, Allah knows that He will reach the four corners of the world. Not only four, but eight. Thank you. That's a very good question. She says that, why is Islam the fastest growing religion in the world? Why is it spreading so much? You know, though the Western world, however much they try to attack Islam, they will not be able to do it. Why is it spreading? Sister, the reason is, as I said in my talk, that Islam is the most logical way of life. It is the only religion which is based on complete truth. And even the Western world, you know, they say, you know, the major attacks of the Western world about Islam is on women in Islam. Therefore, out of 20 questions, Five are based on women's rights in Islam. You know, they attack Islam maximum on the women's rights. And do you know, sister, that today, amongst the Americans that convert to Islam, 60%, more than 60% are women. It's an irony that the Western world is saying Islam doesn't give rights to the women, but there are more women accepting Islam than men. Do you know that? Throughout the world, in Europe, more women accepting Islam. In India, more women accept Islam. Even in Singapore, it will be the same case. If you take the statistic maybe from MCA, they will be in a better position to tell you about Singapore. But throughout the world, there are more women accepting Islam. Though the Western world is attacking Islam, the major point is they don't give rights to women. But that is only theoretical. Practically, there is no religion in the world except Islam which gives total rights to the women. So because if you analyze this logically and scientifically, Islam is the best way of life, therefore it is spreading. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, inna dina in the Allah islam The only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. And Allah gives a promise in the glorious Quran, thrice. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9. As well as in uh, chapter 48, verse 28, Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْثِ رَسُولُهُ بِلُدَى وَالدِّينُ الْحَقِّ لِيُذْهِرُوا عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ وَرُوْكَهِ الْمُشْرِكُونَ That Allah has sent His Messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life, over all the other religions, over all the other isms. Islam is destined to supersede all, master them all, overcome them all, however much the mushrik don't like it. And once Allah says, that وَقَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَيْدًا And enough with Allah as a witness. So Allah said that He has given this religion of truth and sent a messenger with guidance so that it will prevail over all the other religions. Islam is the only religion and Quran is the only religious scripture which has the solution to the problems of mankind. That's the reason it is the fastest in religion. Hope that answers the question. I've got a question here. Uh, whether non-Muslims will go to heaven and what about the case of Mother Teresa? The question posed was that will non-Muslims go to heaven and what about Mother Teresa? The reply to this question, who will go to heaven, Jannah, is given in Surah Al-Asr, chapter 103, verse number 1 to 3, which says, Wal-Asr, inna al-insara fi khus, illa ladhin amanu, wa amlu salihati, wa tawasaw bil haqqa, wa tawasaw bil sabr. That by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed. Those who exhort people to truth and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. The minimum criteria is required for any human being to go to Jannah is four. Have faith, Iman. Have righteous deed. Exhort people to truth, to Dawah and Islam. Exhort people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these four criteria are missing, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim. You may have performed Hajj, you may be offering Salah, you may have kept past the month of Ramadan. But if you don't do Dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. All four criteria are equally important. Iman, righteous deed, exhorting people to the truth, Dawah and Islam, and exhorting people to patience with him. If anyone is missing, you shall not enter Jannah. So any human being wants to go to Jannah, heaven, you should fulfill all these criteria. Let's take the example of Mother Teresa. You know, we learn and we hear that she got Nobel Prize and, you know, she has done many good deeds, etc. You know, people have given an award, Nobel Prize. We hear in the newspaper, so maybe you say, righteous deed, you know, she gets a high level, righteous deed. You make it high level. Exhorting people to truth, what's the degree? You know, I'm coming from Bombay. I'm an Indian. You know, I have seen many of her organization and many people can tell you the inside story. The other person, I think he was European from UK, I think, if I'm not mistaken. He wrote a book on Mother Teresa, her inside story. And that book was telling all the negative points that she is the person who has misled so many people, etc. But that Allah knows the best. I leave it to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they are mainly missionary activities they do. They do missionary activities. And how do they help the poor? And the ultimate goal is to convert them to Christianity. I can say because I know I'm, I'm living in Bombay and many of us are in Bombay. But regarding whether she'll go to heaven or not, See, suppose if you want to pass a school, if you want to pass standard 10, suppose there are six subjects, maths, geography, English, history, science, and whatever it is, there are six subjects. And you may score 99 out of 105, but if you fail in one, will you pass standard 10? Will you, yes or no? Yes or no? You will fail. You have to pass in all the six subjects. Similarly, to go to Jannah, you should pass in all four. If anyone is missing, you may get 100 marks in any one particular aspect. I am not saying that Mother Teresa got 100 marks in righteousness. I am not telling that. So don't misunderstand me. But surely she didn't have Iman. So if anyone is missing, you shall not go to Jannah. Even a Muslim who is born in a Muslim family, if he feels he has got the ticket to heaven, it's a misconception. Just by being born in a Muslim family, being called as Muhammad, or Zakir, or Sultan, you don't get a ticket to heaven. You have to follow all the four criteria, Iman, 
right says deed, exhorting people to truth, exhorting people to patient perseverance. So any human being, whether it be Mother Teresa, whether it be Sultan, whether it be Muhammad, whether it be Abdullah, whoever it is, or Tom, Dick and Harry, if they fulfill these four criteria, inshallah they will go to Jannah. If anyone is missing, under normal circumstances, they shall not go to Jannah. Hope they answer the question. They shall not go to Jannah. Hope they answer the question. Yes, brother. Islam has uh, fought in the past and present also against a lot of number of uh, social ills. So one of the most tragic social systems which existed in the past was the slavery system. Even though Islam has uplifted the status of slaves in the past, it did not abolish completely the slavery systems from the earth. So brother asked a very good question that Islam has taken away many of the social evils like alcohol, drugs, etc. And one of the great social evils is slavery. And rightly said that Islam was the major benefactor where slavery is concerned. It gave rights to slaves, etc. But why didn't it abolish completely? There are many things that were abolished by Islam. It came in stages. Some were abolished on the spot, some in stages. For example, if you know how alcohol was prohibited, it came in stages. The first time Quran speaks about alcohol, was for a Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 219, that when they ask the concerning intoxicants and gambling, tell them in it is profit and loss. The loss is more than profit. The first verse regarding intoxicants was that in it is more loss and less profit. It didn't ban it completely. Next verse of intoxicants, Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 43, that do not pray with your mind before unless you can understand. That means while praying, you should not have intoxicants. More restriction. And the final prohibition came in Surah Maidah, chapter number 5, verse number 90, which says, Ya yuhal ladhina amun, O you who believe, inna man khamru al maithuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, were anzabu al azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishtum min amali shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. Pashtani mulla lakum tuflihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. After this verse, intoxicants was totally abolished. It was haram for you to have. Now, slavery, was very much ingrained in the culture of the Arabs at that time. So, again, the abolition of slavery came in stages. Initially, Allah SWT says that even they are human beings, give them rights. If you have to marry them in Maher, give them freedom, etc., 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 slowly, slowly. But, there are various verses saying that free the slaves, etc., help them, give them charity, etc. But there is no direct verse in the Quran itself which totally prohibits the reason for the total abolition of slavery was it was supposed to be abolished afterwards because it was so much ingrained that most of the things which came as completely, alhamdulillah, during the time of the Prophet it was fulfilled. But certain things if you read scholars have given their comments and they say that this was so much ingrained that Islam set the ball rolling and the final outcome was supposed to take place maybe a few decades or few years after the death of the beloved Prophet. Many things took place while you are alive, this abolition of slavery, Islam set the ball rolling and saw to it that it was completed, if not during the time of the Prophet, at least after that. Therefore, if you read in the Quran, there are several verses praising the slave, giving them the rights, etc. So it was so much ingrained, it was so much there in the society, that it was supposed to be stopped maybe a few years after the death of the beloved Prophet. Hope that answers the question. Please speak louder, Imran. I have two questions which is uh, intertwined. Okay? Okay, uh, I agree with you that much of the distortion of the Islamic image is uh, done by the Western media, but at the same time, I also think that uh, much of it is called by the Muslims themselves. See, uh, I think if we understand that, uh, according to the Christian scriptures, it says that Jesus said that by the fruits you shall know them. So that by the fruits you shall know them. So that is why they are judging us by the products that we produce. So my question number one is, how much have the Muslims actually done to to actually project a healthy image of Islam? Okay. And then uh, I met with an American friend of mine and he says that, you see, the Muslims, they are always judging on us, the West. Okay? They are always saying that we are low in mor morals and such. But what the West needs is actually a solution to it. And then uh, he said that when he ponders upon the, uh, the Muslim countries, there is so much corruption in Pakistan, there is so much violence in the Middle East, that it doesn't give a healthy image of Islam. Okay? Uh, so he was wondering how much does bringing Islam to the West will make sure that it will not fall into the same category as the Muslim countries. So Dr. Zaki, my, my next question is that while the Da'is are traveling around the world to spread the good image of Islam, 
how much are these da'is actually doing to actually correct the Muslims' misconceptions themselves and talk to people like Usama Laden or to the Taliban, etc. And say to them that, look, no matter how good your intention is, what you are doing is damaging to Islam. Thank you. Well, there are two questions. The first question that, you know, if you see that there are many Muslims who are bad, Pakistan corruption is there, etc., the Islam is majorly spoiled. So he's asking the question that the non-Muslim mainly pick up the people and they say that, you know, if Islam is good, then how come the Muslims are bad? And I believe I've given the answer to this question. If you heard my second last answer, it's the same answer, that don't judge a car by the driver. Don't judge Islam by what Muslims are doing. What they're doing, they're picking up black sheep and portraying them. Corruption in Pakistan, Muslim country, who says a Muslim country? Muslim country means follow the Quran and the Sunnah. Muslim in namesake can be possible. I know that there is corruption in Pakistan, I've been to Pakistan. But just because there's corruption, that doesn't mean that Muslims are corrupt as a whole. Yes, few people in Pakistan may be corrupted, they may be more. But if they are corrupt, go to the Quran. Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 188, that do not squander your wealth on manatees. Do not use your wealth as a bait for the judges, in order you may eat other people's wealth. Bribery is Islam in Islam. The second question. What are the Da'is doing to remove this misconception from the Muslims? Why and they make never the Muslims? Whether I can speak on my behalf, I can't speak on the other Da'is. Alhamdulillah, if you see my cassettes, I have spoken on these topics, women rights in Islam, Al-Quran, Shri understanding, dietary laws. My topics are both address non-Muslims as well as Muslims, making them more aware. Many Muslims don't even know the rights which Islam gives to the women. Many Muslims, leave aside non-Muslims. So I educate them also and I do dawa, Islam and dawa together. Regarding values, you can refer to my video called Islam Introduction, where I have given the basic values, I have spoken not to bribe, not to have alcohol, not to cheat, etc. Quran says in Surah Ghaisha, chapter number 88, verse number 21, For your job, O Prophet, is to deliver the message, admonish them. You are not a person who is going to look into their affairs. Our job is to deliver the message. Whether anyone accepts Islam or not, that's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our job is to deliver the message. I have delivered you the message. Whether you follow or not, that's your problem. So our job as dais is to deliver the message of Islam in the best way we can, with hikmah. Whether you agree or not, Allah will question you. Regarding telling Osama bin Laden and Taliban, what they are doing is damaging Islam, etc. Whether that is your view. That is your view that Osama bin Laden and Taliban are damaging Islam. See, for the haq, you mentioned the glorious Quran in Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse 135, it says that, Ya yu lazina amunu, O you believe, stand out firmly for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your kith and kin, whether it be the poor or the rich, Allah protects both. Now what we read in the papers, the Taliban is bad, Taliban is good, you know, we read in the paper, oh, Taliban, they are ill-treating the women, etc. I am not a person of expert on politics. I am a die. I am a die. I am not an expert on politics. But there are experts. If you ask my view about Taliban, you know, Quran says in Surah Hujra, chapter 49, verse number 6, that before you pass on the message, you verify whether it's right or wrong. I read in the papers, in the papers, that the Taliban, oh, they are very ruthless people, you know, they said, all women should stop walking. They should stop walking and they should sit at home, finish. I read it, right or wrong, Allah alam. I read the news from America. In Taliban, they said that it is not good for the women to go out and work because the atmosphere is not modest. We will see to it that they receive their salary at the doorstep. If my sister was living in Afghanistan, and if someone tells me, the atmosphere outside is not good, I will give you a salary at the doorstep. Is it good or bad? If your sister was there in Afghanistan, and someone says, you know that monster there outside is bad, we'll give your sister salary at doorstep without working. Which would you prefer? I am not telling which news is, I don't know which news is correct. So I am not saying Taliban is good or bad. I get two different news. But before you ever make a comment that teach these people, Allah will question you, did you check up the news? So you as a Muslim saying that Osama bin Laden is right or wrong, have you checked up? What we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let me Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them on the straight path. You know, as I said, 
bombing in Nigeria, American consulate, Osama bin Laden, headline. Did or not? We don't know. But if you ask my view, if he's on the truth, if he's fighting the enemies of Islam, I'm for him. I don't know what he's doing. I'm not in touch with him. I don't know him personally. I read for newspapers. If he's terrorizing the terrorist, if he's terrorizing America, the terrorist, biggest terrorist, I'm with him. Every Muslim should be a terrorist. The thing is that if he's terrorizing a terrorist, he's following Islam. Whether he is or not, I don't know. So don't go and tell outside that Zakir Naik is for Osama bin Laden. I am with him if he's terrorizing the terrorist. I am with him and I will do dua for him. If he's not, I am against him. I don't know what he is. I cannot base my judgment as a dai only on news. But you as a Muslim without checking up, laying allegations also wrong. So I am with those people who are following the Quran. Even if the full world is against them, I am with them. You know, because Quran says in Surah Al Imran chapter number 3, verse number 160, it says that if Allah helps you, no one can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who will help you then? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here. It says, if Allah is merciful, why did he create hell? And why is there so much of punishment uh, described in the Quran? The question posed was that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful, then why did he punish people? Why did he create hell? And I do agree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. Every chapter of the glorious Quran, every surah except for Surah Tawbah chapter number 9, begins with the beautiful formula, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. But at the same time, besides being merciful, the glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 40, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. Besides being merciful, he is also very just. Now both these criteria are analyze, he is merciful and just. Now, in order to be merciful and just, sometimes he may also have to punish certain people. You know, for example, there is a person who rapes a woman. If someone rapes my sister and someone says, Oh, God is so merciful, he has forgiven the rapist. What will I do? Will I praise Allah? What will I do? See, Allah is merciful. Allah is merciful, at the same time just. So if he has to be merciful to me, or to the woman who has been raped, what he has to do? He should punish the rapist. Whether he punish in this world or the hereafter, Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 185, that the final recompense shall be paid on the day of judgment. So, if he has to be just and merciful, he will also have to punish certain people. And in that punishment, in the long run, he is also just to that person. For example, if an examination is taking place, and the teacher catches one person copying, then the student says, but teacher, you are so merciful. Teacher says, okay, you continue copying, I am merciful. <laughs> what will the other students do? What will they say? Oh, teacher is so good. You know, she is allowing that student to copy. They will say, oh, we slogged out day and night, and this colleague of ours, this student, he is copying. Teacher is biased. They won't praise the teacher. And if they come to know teachers are always going to allow copying, you know what will happen? Everyone will start copying. Next examination, no one will study. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that whether you commit sin or not, I will put you in heaven. You know, there will be no hell in the hereafter, but this world will become a hell. Won't it? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful, at the same time just, and because he is merciful and just, he also has to give punishment to certain people. But that doesn't mean that you have to lose hope. You have to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you made mistake, Allah will punish you if you don't repent. But if you repent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will surely forgive you. And Allah shows you the way how to repent. Basically there are four criteria of repentance. First, you have to agree what you are doing is wrong. Suppose you did something wrong, you are having alcohol, agree it is wrong. Stop it immediately, point number two. Point number three, don't do it in future. And point number four, if your act has caused harm to someone, see to it you repay that person. If you have robbed something, then give that material back to him. So if you repent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inshallah forgive you. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created hell and heaven because Quran says in Surah Mulk chapter 57 verse number 2 that Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. He has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This life is a test for the hereafter. It is like you telling a teacher, teacher, why have you kept the fail? Only keep first class. Why have you kept second class, third class and fail? So the teacher has only first class, then where is the test? If everyone is going to get first class, then where is the test? So Allah says this world that you are living is a test for the hereafter. If you pass this test, you go to heaven. If you fail, you go to hell. And always, Alhamdulillah, Allah is the most merciful. He is just and he is even severe in giving punishment if you require it. Hope that answers the question. question. Sister, please. In Islam, right, we have hadith which is interpret interpreted by different imam. And this um, led to confusion because some of my friends ask, like, um, if we have different hadiths, right, and some of them are different, as in, you know, like, like one imam said that when we take the wudu, um, at least three st strands of hair, and while others that, you know, the whole head, right, um, okay, some of them say that we are indecisive, as in, we, undecisive, as in, we cannot come up with one hadith. What can we say about this? And, okay, another question is that, um, my teacher said something about that God is cruel, because, um, Habil and Kobil, right, because, um, they had an argument and one of them killed one. Okay, so how can I correct my teacher? She said something like, God is cruel because of this act. Okay. So the first question was that there are different mazhabs and that covers my 17th common question. I said, why there so many sects, etc. Regarding your question that whether the hair should be completely uh, by voodoo, etc. Why the different, why can't the one hadith? Sister, in following the hadith, first check up the authenticity of the hadith. If it is sahih, you have to follow. If it is zaif, you don't have to follow. There are sahih hadith, zaif hadith, and mawzu hadith. If it's a sahih, you have to follow. If it's not a sahih, you don't have to follow. No two sahih hadith will contradict. And there is a the science of hadith, which you have to go through years of studies and how to analyze that. Regarding difference of madhab, you said, this asked the question, what are the difference of madhab? Which madhab to follow? Is that a question? This is the question, which madhab to follow? You know, there are various things. And the answer is given in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, which says, Wa taseemu bi habdillahi jamiyo wa la Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. Which is the rope of Allah? This. Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. Hold to the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith and be not divided. It is forbidden for the Muslims to be divided amongst ourselves. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 159 that anyone who divides the religion and breaks it into sects, you have nothing to do with them. Allah is the Prophet, you have nothing to do with them. Allah will look after their affairs and He will tell them the truth in the end. That means dividing the religion of Islam into sects is haram in Islam. But when you ask a person, what are you? Some person say I'm a Hanafi, some person say I'm a Shafi, some say I'm a Maliki, some say I'm a Deobandi, some say I'm a jamaat islami some say I'm a Varevli. What was the beloved Prophet? Hanafi? Or the Shafi? Or the Deobandi? What was he? He was a Muslim! Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3, verse 52, Isa alayhi salam was a Muslim. Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3, verse 67, that Abraham, peace be upon him, was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. Our beloved Prophet was a Muslim. The Quran gives the answer in Surah Fusilat. Chapter 41, verse number 33. Woman ahasunu kala mimman da ila lahi wa amal salihan kala inna nimin al muslimi. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord? Works righteousness and says that I am a Muslim. I am the one who bows to the will of Islam. So if anyone poses the question, what are you? You should say I am a Muslim. All these Imams, Alhamdulillah, I respect them all. They were great Imams. Imam Shafi, Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with them. Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. May Allah be pleased with them all. They were great scholars. I respect them. If someone follows their particular views, I've got no objection. You know, you, some person says, Imam Shafi, may Allah be pleased with him, is right here. Imam Abu Hanifa is right here. Alhamdulillah. I've got no objection. But if someone asks me the question, what are you? You should say, I'm a Muslim. If you don't follow that, you're going against the Quran. You can't call yourself a Hanafi or a Shafi or a Maliki. You should call yourself as a Muslim. You may agree with the views of certain scholars. I've got no objection. But if the view of that scholar goes against the Qur'an and the Hadith, you have to reject that view. Let him be the greatest scholar in the world. If it goes against the Qur'an and the Sahih Hadith, you have to reject the view of that scholar. 
people may pose the question, you know what our beloved prophet said, there will be 73 firqas, 73 sects, what do you have to say about that? There's a hadith in uh, Abu Daud, it's mentioned, hadith number 4579, it says that our beloved prophet said that the religion of Islam will divide into 73 sects. A prophet said there will be 73 sects. He didn't say you should make 73 sects. There will be, he's predicting. That though the Quran says don't make sects, you Muslims are bound to make sects. And then the hadith we mentioned in Trimedi, hadith number 171, that a beloved prophet said, there will be 73 sects in Islam. Out of that, only one will be on the true path. So the companion asked, which sect will be on the true path? The prophet said, that sect which follows me and my companions, which follow the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. So if you are the Muslim sister, you should follow the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. If you have difference of opinion, this scholar says that, this scholar says that, if it matches with the Quran, you agree with that scholar. If it goes against the Quran, you reject that scholar. And most of the problem will be solved. The problem that we have today is because we don't read the Quran with understanding. If you read the Quran with understanding, most of the problem will be solved. Hope that answers the question. Regarding our second question, that the teacher said that Almighty God is cruel. One brother kills the other brother. The sons of Adam, peace be upon him. Sister, tell your teacher that God Almighty didn't tell one brother to kill the other brother. Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any human being, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. Quran doesn't say if you kill a Muslim, any human being, Muslim or non-Muslim, if you kill any human being, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you save any human being, it is as though you have saved the whole humanity. So Almighty God says you should not kill any human being, unless he is creating mischief, he is calling disturbance, he is trying to see to it that peace doesn't prevail. In that case you can, otherwise you should not kill any living creature. That is just the story of a couple of brothers who killed each other. Allah didn't tell them to kill. And Allah is not cruel. Allah is merciful. He is just and even punishes those who require punishment. Hope that answers the question. Punishes those who require punishment. Hope that answers the question. Alhamdulillah. You were saying that just now, Salam is peace. Can we Muslims give Salam to the non-Muslims? Okay. Very good question. Brother said short answer. The complete answer, brother, refer to my video cassette. If the label shows your intent, wear it. Regarding the reply, can you wish peace? The answer is given in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 86, which says, If anyone greets you courteously, greet back more courteously, or at least the same. For Allah is careful on keeping of accounts. If anyone wishes you, Assalamu Alaikum, you have to say, Wa Alaikum Assalam Wa Rahmatullah. Someone says, Peace be on you, the peace and blessings be on you. If someone says, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah, you have to say, Wa Alaikum Assalam Wa Rahmatullah Wa Barakatuh. The peace, blessings and mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala be on you. You have to wish back more courteously. Someone says, Assalamu Alaikum, you say, Wa Alaikum Assalam. The wording is the same, but yet it is coming from within that, that's better. And Allah says in the Quran, wish back more courteously. So surely according to this, if some non-Muslim wishes you, you can also wish them back, more courteously. And regarding, can you wish them? There is a hadith in Sai Muslim, Sai Muslim, various hadith, which says that when the non-Muslim wish you, then say, Alaikum. There is a hadith, but it's not in context. The complete context of the hadith is, that when the Jews wished you, Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum means, may death be on you. So the Prophet said, when someone says, may death be on you, say, Alaikum, on you too. <laughs> so many people misinterpret and saying, that according to the Hadith, you cannot wish back salam to non-Muslim. See, if you read in the Quran, in Surah Maryam, I have to be short, Surah Maryam chapter number 19, verse number 47, that Ibrahim al -Salam, when his father kicks him out of the house, he tells his father, Assalamu Alaikum, peace be on you. I will pray to my Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your sins. Ibrahim alayhi salam says to his father, who was a mushrik, Assalamu Alaikum. Quran says in Surah Furqan, Surah Taha, Surah Qasas, you can refer to my cassette, that when the ignorant approach you, tell them, Talu Salama, peace be on you. So very well brother, you can wish them Salam, and if they wish you, you can even wish them back. Hope that answers the question. Wish you, you can even wish them back. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhru da'wana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alamin. Um, I must thank everyone for being patient. We have extended this lecture more than we should. Uh, before we end, on behalf of the Rakhamnak, to thank you again, and I look forward for 
to seeing you at that Arkham, the Galaxy Building, for the in-house lectures. And if you've got more questions, as there are some here, please bring them again, and we will take them in Galaxy. With that, we'll end the session with Tasbih Kafara and Suratul As. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfirka wa adubu wa ilayk wa al-as Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-as inna al-insana lati khusr illa lazina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasu bil-haq wa tawasu bil-sab Sadaqallahu al-azim Assalamualaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh